Welcome back everybody to CS162. So um, we're gonna pick up where we left off talking about virtual memory and uh, memory mapping, and then we'll continue with paging uh, uh, next time. But uh, if you remember, we were looking at this uh, idea in general of address translation and the memory management unit that does it. And in this scenario uh, where virtual addresses are coming out of the CPU, they get translated by this memory management unit into physical addresses, which represent the actual uh, positions of the bits in the physical DRAM. Um, so there's kind of two views of memory. There's the view from the CPU, which is the virtual addresses, and the view from memory, which is the physical addresses. And those two um, are basically related by a page table, which is what the MMU supports. Now, um, the one thing that uh, we did talk through last time is we actually gave you a couple of examples where we walked through some um, instruction execution that was going on in the processor. And we kind of showed you when you keep to the virtual addresses and when you actually have to translate into physical ones. Uh, so with translation, it's much easier to uh, implement protection, protection because if two processes uh, have their translation tables set up so they never intersect with physical memory, then it's impossible for them to interfere with each other through memory. Um, an extra benefit of this, of course, is that everybody gets their own view of their personal address space, which means that you can link uniquely uh, a program to the you know, once and run it multiple times on the same machine, okay? Everybody gets their own zero is the way I like to think of that. We talked about simple paging in this context. And um, the idea of simple paging is basically that there is a page table pointer and that page table pointer points to memory, which is uh, a set of consecutive translations. We'll call these page table entries a little bit later. And these uh, consecutive entries basically have both a physical page number and a, um, some permission bits, okay? And there's one of these page tables per process, all right? And so the way the virtual address mapping goes, we talked about this, is you start with an offset, which is how big your page is. And so for instance, for a, a 1K page, that's gonna be 10 bits. For a 4K page, that'll be 12. And then all the rest is the virtual page number. And that um, offset, never gets changed by the page mapping. So that's copied directly into the physical address. And then the virtual page number is basically used as an index into the page table. You look that up and that gives you the physical page number which gets copied in and uh, you're good to go on the physical address. Um, so for instance, uh, if you had one uh, K, K byte pages or 1024 pages, um, there's 10 bits of offset. And what's left in red is basically 32 minus 10 bits or 22 bits in a 32 bit machine. So there's essentially uh, up to 4 million entries in this page table, all right? And so among other things, we're not necessarily gonna use them all. And so we need the page table size. And so there are certain uh, indices in here or virtual page numbers, which are above the page table size, in which case you get an error. And then we also need to check our permissions. So if we try to do a write and you see that this particular page is marked as valid, that's V and read, but not write. This is essentially a read only page. So if you attempted to write to that address, you'd get an error, okay? Were there any questions on this simple paging idea? Now we're, we're talking about the function of that memory management unit I showed you earlier, okay? So the, the hardware there is gonna help us by translating these virtual addresses into physical ones. So the other thing uh, I did is I gave you a very simple example. Um, this is almost a silly example because it's four byte pages, but because they're four byte pages, you know that the offset's only gonna be two bits. Um, and basically what we can see here is that a virtual address zero zero, we write that all out into, uh, into binary basically. The lower two bits are zero. The upper two, um, upper six bits in this case are zeros. And so we take what's in red here and that's gonna be our virtual page ID, which we'll look up in our page table. And what we see there is that there's a four, okay? And I don't have any permission bits in this example, but that four represents the translated page, okay? And so I take that four, that's really zero, 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 one, zero, zero. Okay, that's the uh, physical page ID. I copied the offset and that told me that things that are up here in uh, the uh, virtual address space are gonna be down here in physical space. And we looked at 
uh, multiple options here as well, like for instance, things from four to eight map basically to page three, which is down here. Things from uh, eight to uh, C are gonna map to the green up here and that's going through the page table, all right? And then of course, if you look at things in the middle, like for instance, uh, four here has got an E in it, uh, five has got an F, six has got a G, where does that translate over here? Well, we can see that that's going to be right um, basically over here. But the question is, how do we get there? Well, we take the fact that six uh, is 00000110, because 110 is six, as you all know. And um, that means that we're talking about page one, which is the blue one. The offset is one zero, and that takes us over to this point, OE. And similarly, nine takes us over to uh, this point, 05. Okay, now there's a question here, is page zero always unmapped so that dereferencing null pointers always uh, cause page faults? No, not necessarily, because sometimes uh, page zero is uh, reserved for the operating system and can represent um, different things like IO and so on. So zero is not always unmapped. Um, it often is, but you can't necessarily be assured of that. And that's why, in fact, null references can be very bad because some languages like C let them happen. Um, okay, so, uh, but you could, if you can afford to unmap zero, then uh, obviously you get a little bit of extra protection there because you could cause a page fault uh, because zero wouldn't be, in, wouldn't be valid in that case. So what about sharing? So um, first of all, actually, let me stop here for a second. Are there any pieces of this that people are worried about? Now, I told you last time, that um, you need to get really good at transforming between hex, which is four bits at a time, and binary. Um, I'd get to memorize that quite well because that's something that'll serve you well if you know how to do it. All right. Um, good. Now, what about sharing? All right. So once we start having this mapping, now we can do some pretty interesting things. Uh, okay. Here's a question. Let me just answer this. Why are we taking the top six bits? when there are only three entries in the page table? Well, because presumably this is an eight bit machine and uh, therefore everything that's not an offset, remember I said these are four byte, byte pages are basically the uh, page ID, the virtual page ID. And so this page table needs to uh, potentially have up to 64 entries in it. But because the page table uh, only has three entries, then the, the size of the page table is going to be set at three. Okay, And if you notice back here in my previous example, I showed you this idea that you have a page table size. And so what that really says is there are some virtual addresses in this scheme that are not valid. They're ones that are uh, for which the virtual page ID is too big. All right, good question. Okay, But we have to take six bits because we have to take all the bits that aren't the offset. Now, uh, if you look here, so here's another example. We have our virtual page ID in the offset. And what's interesting about this scheme is that now we can do something like this, virtual page number, which is going to have a two in it. It's going to be 0, 0, 0, 2 here, uh, might map to a, a place in physical memory. OK. And um, we might have a second uh, page table that also maps to that same place in physical memory. So now we have two processes, two separate page tables, both mapping to the same physical page, OK? So this is interesting, right? This basically means that that physical page now appears in the address space of both processes. So they can share information, all right? So if uh, process A writes to uh, something in page two, it'll show up in this page. If, virtual, if process B writes to somewhere in page four, it'll show up in this page, and they can read and write each other's data. All right. Now, this is not a great mapping. Okay. Why? Well, because I mapped the same page to different parts of the address space for these two processes. So in fact, if you look in process A, um, I can read, write at address uh, 0002XXXX, and B, I can read at address 0004XXX. And so the addresses are actually different. All right, which means that I can't make a linked list here and have the addresses mean something between the two processes. So that's a little broken. So in fact, it would be better to actually link them to the same place. Now, there's a good question in the chat here about can you arrange to set that up? And yes, there are virtual memory mapping uh, system calls that allow you to map the same 
page to the same part of, of uh, virtual memory and thereby make sure that you can do things like link lists that are shared between multiple processes. Notice that the other thing that I've shown you here is that process A has both read and write permission to this page, while process B does not. And so that might be a producer consumer scenario where process A is producing something and process B is consuming it. And of course, once you've got shared memory, then you need to synchronize and uh, we get back to the synchronization we've been talking about. All right, questions. Can everybody see why I'm talking about all the addresses being of the form 0x, 0002XXX and 0x0004XXX. Okay, why why am I saying that process A has addresses like 00002XXX? Okay. Yeah, so this corresponds to virtual page number two and number four. And if you notice, the, this is hex, right? So hex represents four bits. So I have XXX. In this instance, there are um, 12 bits total. So I'm talking about a 12-bit uh, offset, which means a 4K page, OK, in this instance. And then all the other bits, the, the remaining ones above, are going to be um, the ones that I use for my virtual page number. And so also get comfortable with figuring out what's the offset and then what's left over is the virtual page number. All right, good. And of course, if I, if I map the page in the same place in both of these, then the addresses would exactly match and then I could make a linked list or something. Okay, so what's a typical offset nowadays? That's a good question. So 4K, 12 bits, very common. Um, some of the higher end machines might get you to 16K, okay? But um, uh, 4K is, is pretty common, OK, or 12 bits. Um, now, where do we use sharing? All over the place. So remember, we started out this term at the very beginning saying we needed to protect address spaces from each other so the processes were protected from each other and the kernel was protected from the processes. But we have this sharing mechanism. And I like to think of sharing as selective punching of the, the uh, careful boundaries we've put in processes in a way that does the kind of sharing we want. So for instance, the kernel region of every process has the same page table entries for the kernel, okay? And that allows you to basically pop in and out of the kernel um, to, uh, without having to change any page table mappings, okay? So the process is not, I'll show you this in a second, the process is not allowed to access it at user level, but once you go from user to kernel, like say for a system call, now the kernel code can both access its own data and the user's data, okay? But if it wants to access data uh, from other user processes, it's gonna have to do something different at that point. Um, if you want different processes running the same binary, uh, we talked last time, uh, I was accused of starting a, uh, a culture war, but if you wanted to run Emacs multiple times, for instance, or VI, if you want to be a, a, a West Coaster, then um, you can have the same binary stored in a, um, a set of physical pages, and then multiple processes can link to that binary, and you don't have to uh, waste memory with duplicate code. Okay, that's great. And that's, that extends to dynamic uh, user level system libraries. You can also make that be uh, shared only read only, excuse me, and then everybody can share them. Um, and so obviously the last one is the one I was just showing you, which is sharing memory segments between different processes, uh, allowing you to essentially share objects between different processes and thereby do um, you know, interesting communication. Now, of course, uh, you gotta be careful about that because the two processes are now trusting each other uh, the, to uh, put data in each of those, you know, in that shared page that is properly formatted and can be uh, properly interpreted by the other process. Okay, so that's a little bit less secure potentially, unless you're very careful. So um, now we can do some simple security measures also with this. Like for instance, we can randomize 
where the user code is. Rather than always starting it at a particular part in virtual address space, we can start it in different parts. And that randomization, which I'll show you in another picture, helps to make it harder to attack when you've got certain things like uh, overflow errors and so on, which you might have heard about if you've taken 161. Um, it also means the stack and the heap can start anywhere, again, for security reasons. Um, and then we can also use kernel address space isolation, uh, where we don't map uh, the whole kernel space, but just part of it. And um, that can give us a little more security. Uh, notice that when we talk about Meltdown, which we will mention in a subsequent lecture, uh, we have to, in fact, make sure that essentially none of the kernel space is mapped into user space. But uh, we'll get to that a little later. But if you look at this scheme I've got here with user space and kernel space, what this means is that because of bits that are set in the page table entry, um, when I'm at user mode, I'm not able to actually uh, access any of the kernel page table entries, even though they're mapped. They're not available to the user, but the moment that you take a system call, now suddenly both the user's uh, memory and the kernel memory are all available to the kernel. And this makes it much uh, cleaner and simpler to do a system call. So here's a typical layout. I actually showed you this last time, but um, we see a bunch of holes in here. And these holes um, are basically allowing us to do randomization and thereby making it harder to put uh, executable code on the stack and a few other things um, and harder to attack. And so that's a good security measure. Okay. But all of these holes are whole things that we need to support. And of course, unfortunately, so far with our page tables, we don't have a good way to support holes because in order to go from zero up to FFFFF, we need to have all of the page table filled 100% filled and a lot of these empty spots are just going to be null entries that say, you know, invalid and that's a waste. And so we need to do something different and that's part of our topic next. Okay. Questions. Okay, so right now the page table I've showed you this is answering a question in the chat, doesn't actually allow you to spread everything around without wasting a bunch of entries that are null. Okay, so um, right now, in order to map this virtual space, I would have to have all of my entries, but um, a bunch of them are gonna be empty and that's a waste. And so we're gonna fix that, okay? And you're right, we can map around in physical space any way we want, but virtual, uh, the virtual part of this is, is wasted yet. So. Just to summarize, I just wanted to give you a little bit. Here's an example. We have to have, here's our virtual memory. We've got all these holes. That means the page table has to be 100% full. Okay, so those advantages that we might have by setting the length of the page table to less than the full size, we lose it because we have to map the whole page table. And that's because we need to have things like the stack at the top of the page table and things like the code near the bottom. And so that's a waste. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you here is this virtual memory view goes through the page table and maps to data that's potentially spread all over in the physical memory. And I'm even showing you some gray things here which represent other processes. And so that um, scrambling of the physical memory is a big advantage of page tables because now we can manage it much easier because every one of these pages is exactly the same size and we can allocate or deallocate them any way we want. The other interesting thing I wanted to show you here is here's the typical stack grows down, heap grows up. Um, if you notice in this case, the stack only currently has two pages associated with it that are actually mapped. The rest of these entries, like the one right underneath the stack, if you look over here in the page table, is currently got a null entry in it. Okay, And um, that null entry means there's nothing mapped in here. So the moment that we get to try to um, go below that stack, and suppose we're just pushing things on the stack and we hit this point, we're gonna cause a page fault, which we'll talk a lot about next time. And at that point, we can actually add some more memory. Okay, so if the stack grows, we just add some more uh, stack, and now all of a sudden we've got more stack. And so what's great about this is that we're able to start with the smallest amount of physical stack uh, that we can and we'll grow the stack as a process needs it so we don't have to commit physical resources to the stack uh, because the page faulting lets us grow that uh, dynamically as we need it. Um, 
the page table base register is actually going to be in CR3 in the uh, x86 processor. And so I'll show you that in a moment. Um, OK. Challenge. Now, just to summarize what I've been saying here is that the, ta the table size is equal to the number of pages in virtual memory. So if you were to count up the number of potential pages, even the empty ones, that's the size of our page table and entries. And that I'm, the thing I'm saying is really unfortunate about what I've told you. So clearly what I've told you isn't really the full story, OK? And that's our next topic. So how big do things get? All right, so let's talk about size. So if we have a 32-bit address space, by the way, I'm going to go through these just to make sure everybody's on the same page with their powers of two. OK, this is you are now uh, Uber OS students. And so you need to know these things, and you'll know them well. So for instance, in a 32-bit address space, 2 to the 32 bytes or 4 gigabytes, OK? And notice that I've got G, capital G, capital B. So a lowercase b means a bit, a capital, uh, a capital B means a byte. OK, that's 8 bits. For memory, all right, kilo is not 1,000. It's 2 to the 10, which is 1,024. That's almost 1,000, but not quite. Now, I think in 61A or something, they might have called this a kibby. OK, and kibbies are great if, uh, although they always sound like cat food to me, but they're great if you've, uh, if they come for you. OK, a kubi byte, I don't know how much a kubi byte is. It's really big. Um, a, a M for mega is 2 to the 20, which is almost a million, but not quite. OK, well, it's more than a million. Um, sometimes called a MIBI. G for giga is 2 to the 30. Not quite a billion, sometimes called a Gibby. The thing that you need to know is that when you're dealing with memory, you need to sort of mentally translate K, M, and G into the powers of 2 rather than powers of 10, because um, people don't always give you K, I, M, I, and G, I. In fact, they far fewer than um, they do it far uh, less often than you might like. Okay. And, um, and it might be maybe with an E, uh, if that's true. Um, so the other thing that's a little uh, confusing about this, by the way, is that when you start dealing with things like network bandwidth, and you say kilobytes per second, that is a power of 10. <laughs> OK? And so this, unfortunately, this terminology is very confusing. And, um, and there, I just want you to be aware of the confusion, because you're going to run into it as you go. So a typical page size, as I said, was 4 kilobytes, which is uh, how many bits? Well, if 2 to the 10th is 1,024, then 4 kilobytes is an extra 2 bits, because 2 to the 2nd is 4, and so that's 12 bits. Okay. How big is a sample page table for each process? Well, let's look at this. If a page uh, itself is 2 to the 12th in size bytes, and they're 2 to the 32 total, I just divide the 2, which means I subtract the powers of uh, and I get 2 to the 20, which is about a million entries. And they're going to be four bytes each. I'm going to show you what the entries look like in a moment. So that's about four megabytes would be wasted in a page table where a lot of them are, are empty. So we're going to need to do something different. Um, so when a 32-bit machines first got started, this is things like the VAX 11780, um, the Intel 8386, et cetera, 16 megabytes was a lot. OK, and so four megabytes was a quarter of all memory. So this is clearly not something we want to do. <laughs> all right. Um, and just to hammer this home, so how big is a page table in 64-bit processor? All right, so 2 to the 64 over 2 to the 12 is 2 to the 52nd, which is about uh, 4.5 exa entries, 4.5 times 10 to the 15th. They'd be eight bytes each, um, which is 36 exabytes in a single page table. All right, that's clearly a waste. And so um, this page table thing that I showed you, I'm calling it a simple page table. It's clearly not what we want. This is just a lot of wasted space. All right. Questions? So the address space fundamentally is sparse. Remember all those holes I showed you? And so we want a, a layout of our page tables that handle holes well. And really, what's a page table? So um, Let's think about this. What do you need to switch on a context switch? Well, you just need to switch the top pointer. So that's easy. 
in some sense to the address space. Now, what is not so easy is oftentimes you have to flush a bunch of TLB entries and so on. So switching the address space can be uh, more expensive than just switching the pointer. Um, now, what provides the protection here? Well, translation per process and dual mode execution. So what that means is only the operating system is able to A, install the, um, uh, to install the page table pointer and only the kernel is allowed to change the page tables, okay? Because we can't let the process alter its own page table. Now, the question about is the process's page table stored with its PCB, typically it's a different part of memory. It's kind of like on the kernel's heap in some sense because um, a PCB has sort of got pointers to everything, but it doesn't necessarily contain uh, big things like page tables. That's a good question though. It, it could in principle, um, it often doesn't. But some analysis here is uh, the pros of the page table thing that we've come up with so far is it's very simple memory allocation because every page is the same size. It's easy to do sharing. The cons are if the address space is sparse, which it is, then uh, you start wasting a bunch of entries. If the table's really big, now um, the problem is that you're not running uh, every process all the time. And so you're wasting a huge amount of memory. And it'd be really nice if we could have an actual working set of our page table. And so you can see that we're gonna stray into caching very quickly here, all right? So the simple page table is just way too big and uh, we don't wanna have to add all in memory, et cetera. And so is there something else we can do? And maybe we could make our table have multiple levels in it. And so that's where we're going. Now, is the, uh, does the page table also specify whether something's accessible to the user uh, or the kernel? Yes, and there's a bit in the page table entry. I'll show you that in just a second. So how do we structure the page table? Well, a page table is just a map or a function from virtual page number to physical page number, all right? Like this, right? Virtual address in, physical address out. And so there's nothing that says that this just has to be a single table. Um, if it is a single table, it's very large, just ridiculously large as we just showed. What else could we do? Well, we could build a tree or we could build hash tables, okay? You, you think of it, uh, we could come up with it. And so um, one fix for uh, the sparse address space is the two level page table idea. And I wanna show you what I like to call the magic page table. This is a fun one. You'll see why it's magic in a moment, but this is for 32 bit addresses and um, it's a tree of page tables where uh, we have 4K pages. So 4K pages means 12 bits of offset and four byte page table entries. Okay, so these are four bytes total and I'll show you what's in those four bytes in a moment. But what that means is that we can take the virtual address, we have our 12 bit offset and two 10 bit indices. And the first 10 bits goes to the first level page table and it's used to select one of 1,024 entries, which there will be because 4K bytes divided by uh, four bytes is 1,024. And then the second one will actually pick the second level and that will give us the physical page number. And of course we copy, copy the offset there, okay? And so the tables in here are all fixed size, all right? And in, in particular, they're all 4K bytes in size. So these page table sub entries are four kilobytes. This one is four kilobytes. The pages themselves are four kilobytes. So what's cool about everything being four kilobytes is now we can start talking about swapping parts of the, or paging out parts of the page table to disk. And so only those parts of the page table we're actively using even have to be in memory. Okay, now, of course, the top level one always has to be there if that process can run, but there's a whole bunch of other ones at lower levels that don't have to be there, okay? Um, so the tables are fixed size. On a context switch, we just have to save this single page table pointer uh, in the PCB, for instance, and the page tables themselves aren't necessarily stored in the PCB, but that page table pointer is the address space uh, descriptor. And just by switching that out, possibly with flushing TLBs, we'll get to that later, um, is enough to change the whole address space of the machine and go from one process to the next, okay? Now the valid bits on the page table entries, I sort of indicated we could, pay, we could uh, swap out the pages, but what did I mean by that? Well, if you, if you look at this situation where we take 10 bits, we look it up in the first level page table, if we had this second level page table, if that wanted to be out on disk, we could actually mark this first level as invalid. And then what would happen is 
we would uh, try to look up this virtual address. Those 10 bits would look up the first page table entry. We would see it's invalid. We'd cause a page fault. That page fault would then um, get resolved by the operating system by bringing the next level page table in. We'd retry. And now the first 10 bits would work. The second 10 bits would get tried. And maybe this one would be marked invalid, in which case we pull the actual page in from disk. And then we finally are able to actually do the reference. Now, that sounds really expensive because the disk, remember, access is a, is a million um, instructions worth. But because of a sort of, of a caching view of the world, we only do this once. And then the multiple one times that we do that afterwards, everything's faster. OK? All right, questions. Now, good question. Is the information about how the page table is structured built into the hardware? Yes. All right, so that typical machines these days, like the memory management unit I showed you that would be on the x86, uh, have a particular structure for the page, page table built into them. OK? Um, and it's thereby the same for uh, pretty much all processes that are actually running on a given machine at a given time. Um, now, some machines like MIPS processor line and basically the things that were related to them actually do something a little different where they don't have hardware that, that walks its way through the page table or does what we call a page table walk. They actually have software. And when you um, try to access something that's not in the TLB, which we haven't heard about, you'll actually trap to software. And then the software can pretty much structure the page table any way they want. But the page tables you're dealing with now with Pintos on the x86, that's a hardware page table walk. And so the structure of the page table is absolutely built into the hardware. All right. Now, um, here is the classic 32-bit mode of an x86. I just wanted to show you this. Um, so the Intel terminology, rather than saying there is two levels of page table, they actually call, is that, call that top level a page directory. Uh, but you know that's just a, a terminology thing. But essentially, you have the CR3, which is the register uh, only accessible to the kernel that defines the top level page table. It points at the page directory. We take 10 bits off of the address, point it at that page directory. That gives us uh, the next page table. OK, so that's actually going to give us a 20-bit pointer to the next page table in physical memory. 10 bits come out of the table. The, uh, the next 10 bits come out. That looks up the next page table entry. That'll give us 20 bits that represent the physical page. And then we combine it with the offset. And that gives us the actual final address we're looking at. OK, now I just threw something at you very quickly. But let's see if we can understand this. If you look at the way addresses, even the physical ones, are structured, there's a 12 bits of offset and 20 bits of, of either virtual or physical address. So that means that when I specify a physical page, I have to give 20 bits uh, of unique address to specify that physical page. And then the offset, the, the remaining 12 bits can be anything we want, but that physical page is defined by 20 bits, which means that this page table entry has 20 bits of physical address in it. OK. All right. So some administrivia. Uh, midterm tour is coming up um, Thursday, 10:29. So topics are going to be up until lecture 17. So we have some good topics for the midterm. We've got scheduling, deadlock, address translation, virtual memory, caching, TLBs, demand paging, and maybe a little bit of I/O. Um, so first midterm was somewhat of a dry run. Uh, this next one will actually require you to have your Zoom up and working. Uh, when you're when the TA proctoring TA pops into your Zoom room, um, you need to have things going. So just be aware that um, you should make sure you get your setup going. Things are going to be almost the same as they were last time, uh, except which worked reasonably well, except for the fact that I think we're going to pre-generate all your Zoom rooms for you, and then you're just going to be uh, connecting to them. But uh, watch for that. And um, anyway, we want to make sure that your setup is debugged and ready. Okay. Um, there will be a review session. We don't have any details on that yet, but we'll get out the Zoom uh, details on that. And uh, the most important administrivia that I wanted to say is, you know, the US election's coming up. For those of you who are uh, citizens or have the ability to vote, absolutely vote. Um, 
This is uh, it's the most important thing that you can do as a U.S. citizen, and um, you need to do it. And actually, if you don't do it, then it's uh, not, uh, you know, you don't get to complain about the results. But I would say don't miss the opportunity. And of course, be safe. Uh, if you can vote by mail, do that. Uh, otherwise, wear a mask um, and social distance, but be, be careful, OK? Uh, but I would say, um, without being political, that this is potentially the most important election in a century. So don't miss it, all right? Um, yeah, and those of you in California, don't go to any of these fake ballot boxes. There actually are a bunch of them. Um, you can go to the post office. And what's even better, you can um, sign up to find out about the status of your ballot. There's, a, there's an online thing to do that. I did it. It's awesome. It, I got a notification, a text uh, the moment the uh, post office found it, scanned it. And then when it got to the destination, it said it will definitely be counted. So you get a text every time something happens. So um, be careful of the fake uh, ballot boxes. Thank you for that, Ashley. All right. Um, good. So what is this page table entry of which I uh, speak here? OK, it's basically um, it is the entry in each of the page tables. And it's potentially a pointer to the next level page table, or it's the actual page itself. Um, it's got permission bits like valid, read only, read write, write only. Okay, and so I'm going to give you an example of the x86 uh, architecture. Um, the address is the same format as the previous slide. Okay, so this is going to be for the magic 10, 10, 12 bit offset. Um, intermediate page tables are called directories for x86. But here it looks, okay, so it's 32 bits or four bytes. And um, if you notice, there's 20 bits of physical page number, because remember I said you needed 20 bits to uniquely identify a 4K page. And then the remaining 12 bits are um, interesting, OK? The lowest bit here is the um, presence bit, OK? Most everybody except for Intel calls it the valid bit. Intel likes to name things differently than anybody else, so they call it the presence bit. But the same idea, if there's a 1, that means that this page table entry is, is valid. <laughs> and you can go ahead and do the translation. If it's a 0, it means it's invalid. And all the other bits, all 31 of the remaining bits, are essentially free for the software to use. Um, and that can be an interesting way to uh, keep information about where that page really is if it's not valid and mapped in memory. So that's the, the present bit. The writable bit, w, actually says whether this page is writable. The u bit. Um, basically, is uh, is this a user or kernel uh, page? And so, if it's uh, zero, it's a uh, it's a kernel page. If it's a one, it's user. Um, I believe I may have that reversed. Look it up in the spec. Um, then we have some things about caching. So the uh, PWT and PCD are whether there's no caches allowed or not. So page write transparent means you write straight through the ca external cache, and um, PCD means the cache is disabled. Um, these two things are important when we start talking about memory mapped I.O. So um, we'll talk about that in a, in a few lectures. Um, A says uh, whether this page has been accessed recently or not, and that gets reset by software but set by hardware. D is whether it's dirty, which gets reset by software and set whatever you do a write to that page. And then this PS is going to give you a page size. So if you set this to zero, it's exactly the 10, 10, 12 I showed you. If you set this to one, then um, there's only one level of page table, and you can get four megabyte pages uh, out of it, which you might use for the kernel. OK? Questions? Now, uh, what can you use this for? We'll talk more about this uh, next time and the time after. But invalid page table entry, where the p bit is 0, for instance, can imply all sorts of things. One is that the uh, region of address space is actually invalid. So there may be a hole in the address space that is never going to get filled. Okay, And in that case, a page fault will occur, and potentially the process will be faulted. Um, the other option is that, well, it's not valid right now, but the page is somewhere else. And so potentially go out to disk to pull it in, and that means that after the page fault happens, the kernel will uh, reset the page table entry such that the valid bit's now one, and then you retry the, the load or store, and at that point, it'll go through. Okay. 
The validity portion is checked always first, and so that means the remaining 31 bits can be used by the operating system for location information, like where is it on the disk, for instance, when uh, page table entry is invalid. So a good example is demand paging. OK, this is the simplest thing when you hear about paging um, right off the bat. Demand paging means that we only keep the active pages in memory. The rest of them are kept out on disk, and uh, their page table entries are marked invalid. And so now, rather than having to swap a process out, like we talked about a couple of lectures ago, by sending all of, it, all of its segments out to disk, now we can send just pages that aren't being used out to disk, and we can get much more efficient use of memory that way. Another interesting one is copy on write. So we talked about Unix fork um, multiple times. And the interesting thing about Unix fork, if you remember, is when we fork uh, a new process, both the parent and the child in that case have a copy of the full address space. And we talked about that rather than being so expensive that you copy everything, what you do instead is you copy the page tables, you mark them all as read only, and the moment either the parent or the child tries to write, then they will get a page fault. And at that point, we'll copy the pages and make two copies. It's called copy on write. Okay. Um, another is zero fill on demand. You can say, well, all of these pages are going to be zero because we want to make sure that uh, we don't accidentally reveal information from the previous process that used that physical page. What we do there is we mark the page as uh, invalid. And the moment you try to access it, you get a page fault, and the kernel zero is a physical page for you, maps it, and gives it back to you. And that's a zero page on fill. Okay? And so we're essentially doing, it's like late binding for those of you that have taken uh, interesting language classes in CS. We're kind of late binding our uh, zero fill and our copies. Okay? So here is a, another example that's kind of interesting of sharing. So I'm showing you two processes uh, with page table pointer and page table pointer prime. The important thing to see here is the green part. And notice that we're actually saying that a couple of whole sub pieces of the address space are shared. OK? Um, so the question about, does that mean that zero filling pages doesn't actually delete the information from physical memory? Well, at the point that you hand it over, it does overwrite it. OK, so it makes sure that everything is fully written. And you don't have to worry about what happens before you do that overwriting, because you can't even read it. It's marked as read only, is um, invalid. And so the moment you try to read, you get a page fault. And then the kernel fills it with zeros and gives it back to you. So no worries about your secret keys at that point. OK, so we can share whole sub pieces. All right, and you can imagine that perhaps a whole big chunk uh, might represent the user's space. And you could have a user page table and a kernel page table that just had um, user plus kernel entries in it. And they mostly share the whole page table. And this is going to be uh, useful when we talk about the, the meltdown um, problem. OK, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later. All right. So for two-level paging, very simple, OK? Just like before, here we have an address. Um, and the first three bits are used to look up the first level page table. The second three bits look up the second uh, level page table. And then you get the, uh, the final actual physical mapping. And the point is that this particular slide is showing you virtual memory uh, position mapping all the way to physical memory just to get a better idea how that multi-level mapping goes, OK? And notice that we did we do copy. In this case, uh, 000, 000 gets copied to the offset, OK? So in this case, uh, in the best case, the total size of the page table is approximately equal to the number of pages used by the virtual memory. So this page table is, there's not as much wasted space as a single page table because if we have big chunks of null, of non-mapped uh, space, what we do is we put a null in the top level page table, and then we don't even have to have the second level page table. So we save a whole bunch of space in the page table when we have uh, sparse tables. Okay. Now, we can take this. This is like a meme, right? We can make multi-level pretty much anything we want. And if you can think of it, it's been done. So what about a tree of tables? So the lowest level page table might still be uh, to pages and mapped with a bitmap like we talked about. The higher level might be segmented. And you could have many levels. So here's an example where 
Um, I take the virtual address. I split off some segment ID at the top. Then I have a page number, and then I have an offset. OK, and so I copy the offset, always do. And now the virtual segment number goes to a segment table. And that gives me a base, which is in memory for a page table, at which case I use the virtual page number to look up the page table entry. And that gives me a physical page number. And of course, for all the reasons of sparseness I talked about, what you're really going to do is you're going to have a segment number and then two levels of page table to deal with sparseness. Okay. And then we're going to check for access errors, like is it valid? Um, is it uh, writable or not? Okay, and so there's various places I can get errors. Um, what do you have to save and restore in a context switch here? Remember, for the simple page table only, we just have to sell, save and restore the base. In a segment situation, typically, as I said a few lectures ago, these segment registers are stored on the processor. And in that case, you got to save and restore the segment registers during a context switch. So this is a little bit more expensive. Now, you might say, wait a minute, why are these segment registers not stored in memory? Simply because there's such a small number of them, they're typically just stored in the processor, OK? Um, because it's much faster than going to memory. And you're only paying the cost when you do a context switch, OK? What about sharing complete segments? Well, you know, this is, I, I'm giving you you know, obvious things. This is par for the course, but you can have the virtual segment number of process A and the virtual segment number of process B both point at the same chunk of page table. And now they're essentially sharing that all of the pages that are in that page table amongst these two processors. Okay, so the cool thing about the flexibility you get out of these mapping schemes is you can do whatever sharing is appropriate. The key there being that you're you're punching these holes in the protection afforded by processes. You're punching these holes carefully so that you're only sharing when you want to, rather than sharing and not knowing that you're doing so. Okay. So the pros of the multi-level is you only need to allocate kind of as many page table entries as you need for the application. And I'm going to say that approximately, uh, right? And that's basically gives you a way to have sparse address spaces. It's easy memory allocation. Why is it easy memory allocation? Because the pages are um, all the same size. Okay, And so it's really easy to put those pages on a free list. In fact, you don't even have to put them on a list. You just have to have a very large bitmap. Um, it's easy sharing. I just showed you many ways of sharing. Okay, Cons are there's a pointer per page, typically 4K, uh, 16K pages today. Um, if you got a 64-bit address space, I'm going to show you this in a moment. The page tables still add up even when you've got multi-level page tables, OK? Um, and these page tables need to be contiguous. So that means that each of the sub pieces have to be contiguous. Um, but that's OK, because we're, we're allocating things in 4K at a time, right? And so in the 10, 10, 12 configuration, the page tables have been set up to be exactly one page in size so that the same allocation can be used to allocate both the page table entries and the pages themselves. Um, now, the other con, which we haven't addressed yet, is I've slipped something uh, underneath here without you guys realizing it. These, this looking up multiple levels of translation, there's time involved. Okay, This is not magic. It's hardware. Um, and so every level requires cycles to go to DRAM to look things up. Okay. And so how are we going to possibly deal with that? Because that just seems like I've, I've turned something that was fast, loads and stores to cash, and I've turned it into something slow. What am I going to do? Anybody have any ideas? Caching, exactly. TLB is a type of cache, exactly. Now, um, we're going we're gonna to use caches, all right? And, um, they're, uh, for the person who asked about virtual caches, these are all going to be um, caches where the index uh, in the TLB is going to be virtual, but for the, the actual data caches are going to be physical. And I'll try to mention that when, uh, when it gets there. All right. Now, if you remember for dual mode operation, I just want to toss this out again. Can a process modify its own translation table? No. Because if it could, all of this protection's gone, right? Only the kernel should be able to modify A 
the tables themselves, and B, which tables are in use. That, you know, setting CR3 can only be done in the kernel. So, and to assist with protection hardware is giving you the dual mode, right? We talked about kernel mode versus user mode. And um, even though in x86, there's four of them, we're really only using two. And there's bits in control registers that get set as I go from user mode to kernel mode and back, okay? Just remember this, all right? And in x86, there's actually rings where ring zero is kernel mode, ring three is user mode. And sometimes the ones in the middle are used uh, when you're using uh, virtual machines, okay? And there is some additional support for hypervisors, which we'll talk about in a later lecture, that sometimes people call ring minus one or something like that. All right, so summary of all of this, now that we are um, know more about virtual memory mapping, is that certain operations are restricted to kernel mode. Things like modifying the page table base register can only be done in kernel mode. Um, page tables themselves can only be modified in kernel mode. Okay, now um, there is a question here about, can we use virtual caches and um, avoid some of the fast, some of the slow translation uh, problems? And the answer there is we could, except that virtual caches have all sorts of consistency problems with them. And the simple way to see that is that since every process has its own notion of zero, the moment you put in pro uh, virtual caches, it means that if you try to switch from one process to another, now you got to flush the cache because uh, the, the notion of zero for the first process is different for the notion of zero for the second process. And so virtual caches uh, are not used very much these days because they have that very complicated mess involved in having to flush them when you switch from one process to another. Okay. Now here, let's make this real for a second. Here's the uh, x86. Uh, memory bottle with uh, segmentation. So here we have a segment selector, all right? And typically you get that segment selector out of the instruction. This is for instance, the GS segment. Okay, and that segment selector now gets uh, looked up in a table and that table is combined with an offset to give us a linear address. And now we combine, um, we have that combined address, which is a, a linear address, uh, 32 bits. And now we take that linear address and we look it up. Um, so this is the virtual address space uh, as set by the segments. And now we go ahead and we look up the first page directory, the page table, oops, and uh, we look it up. So we actually have a segment followed by uh, two page lookups, okay? All right. Um, and uh, the, the thing about virtual caches is, yes, it's expensive, which, uh, Computer architects hate expensive operations because they slow everything down. Okay, now I just wanted to show you this is very briefly to say a little bit more about what's in a segment in x86. So segments, there are six of them typically, the SS, CS, DS, ES, FS, and GS segments. They look like this. So there are registers, I was making them green earlier. I probably should have made this mint green, but a segment register has 16 bits. 13 of them are a segment selector um, and then there's a global local bit, and then there's the, uh, the current mode that you're in. And so what's in that segment register? So it's a pointer to the actual segment. So what's in the processor is a pointer to what's in memory. Um, and if you look here, what's in memory is a big table, uh, two different tables actually, the global table and the local table, depending on which bit you've got here. You look it up, that gives you a segment descriptor, and in that segment descriptor is a set of bits that sort of tell you where the segment starts in memory, how long it is, and what are its various uh, protection bits, okay? And um, if you're wondering why this is so messy, by the way, you take the, the things of the same color and you put them together, and that gives you the actual offsets and uh, position of the segment. Can anybody guess why this is so messy? Uh, not easier in hardware. It's just messy. Uh, it's it's not complicated in hardware, but that's not the reason it's messy. The, because it's really messy to have to deal with it in software. So nobody in their right mind would make something like this unless there was a reason. And the reason is that they're trying to do backward compatibility with the original x86 processors, even as they expanded them to 32 and 64 bits. So messy. 
Um, but notice that uh, the original six segments uh, have this RPL, which basically for the code segment tells you what your current privilege level is, zero or three, okay? All right. And the difference between CPL and RPL has to do with uh, the privilege levels of the actual uh, of the actual um, descriptor itself versus what the segment register says. Okay. Now, um, how are segments used? Well, there's one set of global segments for everybody, um, another set uh, of local ones that are per process. In legacy applications. The 16-bit mode um, is is utilized, and the segments are real. Okay, um, they they actually have a base and they have a length, and they do something um, helpful. Okay, and they were originally not paged that way. Once we get to 32 and 64-bit mode, what happens is what I showed you earlier, which is that the segments um, are used to figure out what the linear address is, and then that just goes through a normal paging scheme. And um, modern operating systems, there was this question was on Piazza as well, is really, um, if you notice, the segments, at least the first four segments, are all set such that the base is zero and the length is uh, four gig, which effectively makes them not do anything useful. And the reason for that is that basically operating systems just don't bother with segments and they like, they call that flattened address space, okay? And so you have to keep the segments there because the hardware needs them, but essentially they're, they're set up in a way that doesn't do anything, all right? Um, the one exception is the GS and FS segments are typically used for thread local storage. And so every thread can potentially have a little chunk of memory that um, is unique based on its identity. And you can do things like, you know, move GS offset zero into EAX. That's actually getting the zeroth entry in the thread local storage for that thread. And that's supported by, um, it was originally so supported by some of the GNU tools like GCC, and it's certainly been part of uh, modern operating systems for a long time. The other thing that's interesting is when you get to the 64-bit mode, uh, the hardware doesn't even support segments anymore. So even though they're still in the instructions, in fact, the first four segments have a zero base and no length limits and are uh, unchangeable. And so that, that flat mode has been basically uh, baked into the 64-bit hardware. And the only ones that still have some functionality is FS and GS, and that's because of the thread local store. OK, so you could almost say that segments are essentially unused in modern x86 uh, operating systems, pretty much, OK, except for the thread local store. It definitely would be faster to not have the hardware support segments, but um, if they're not used, but the x86, uh, s several of the modes basically have them, uh, and so they need to support them, okay? And if they were to start from scratch and uh, say they were building a risk processor like RISC-V, which you guys are aware of, you might not put segments in at all. Now, what about a four-level page table? Well, here's a, uh, here's a typical x86-64. There's actually four uh, nine bit entries, the, the, um, the, the physical address uh, page number is long enough that these entries actually have to be eight bytes long, okay? And so um, that's why we have nine bits here instead of 10. And, uh, and so to look up from a virtual to a physical address, you actually have to look up four things, okay? We're starting to get pretty expensive. And then when we get to virtual machines, which we'll talk about, then potentially you double all of this and it gets even more expensive. So for the x86-64 uh, architecture, here we go, CR3, and then four references to get to the actual uh, page, okay? And interestingly enough, you can even have larger pages. So if you look here, let me back this up for a sec. If you notice, um, we take CR3, that gives us um, first level, second level, third level, fourth level. If you actually look in that um, first, second, third level, there's a bit in the page table entry there that if we set it equal to one, there's no fourth level. And therefore, um, we actually get two megabyte page out of this because the offset is 21 bits, okay, rather than 12. And we can also go even further than that if we set uh, PS equal to one in this 
a second level page table, we can get gigabyte pages. All right, so that is a mode supported by the x86-64. And um, these larger page sizes kind of make sense since memory is so cheap these days. Uh, but the trick there is if you allocate really large pages and they're not used, now you got internal fragmentation waste again. And so um, these larger page sizes are typically used by things that are uh, fixed, always present, and unlikely to be paged, where the kernel is a good example. Um, or maybe if you're building a special operating system for something that's uh, streaming really large items, you might use some of these bigger pages. But they're certainly available. Okay. Um, what happens to the higher bits? Um, that's a really good question. And um, I will uh, show you that in a later lecture. But the, the bottom answer, or the simple answer is, um, if you look at the uh, virtual address here um, in all of them, the higher bits are all the same. Um, and what that means is either they're all zeros or they're all ones, okay? And everything in between where they're not all the same is a page fault, okay? And what that looks like in uh, the physical address space is that you have uh, a chunk at the top and a chunk at the bottom and a really big hole in the middle, okay? And that, um, that really big hole is, is, a, is a permanent page fault that you can't map anything into. And the reason that they do it that way is typically the things at the top are kernel and the things at the bottom are user, okay? And as you uh, expand your hardware, you can add more and more bits as you go. Now, there was uh, IA64 actually had a six level page table. No, too many bits. Uh, this was basically an Intel architecture that was uh, designed for really huge machines. And um, they were gonna map all 64 bits, but they didn't wanna do it this way because there's way too much to look up. And so the question is, what else could we do if we're trying to build a table that's mostly sparse? Well, we could build a hash table. Okay, so all of the previous things we're looking at are called forward page tables because you take the virtual address and you peel bits off and you look up in the first level and then you peel off some bits in the second level, third level, fourth level. And instead, we can do an inverted page table, which looks kind of like this, where you take the virtual address and this virtual page offset and you look it up in a hash table and that gives you the physical page. Okay, so um, the advantage of this is now that this hash table is related in size, I'm gonna say of order size, of the number of physical pages you have in DRAM. Whereas this scheme, the size of the page table is related to the number of bits you have in the virtual address. Okay, think that through. Even though we've done this good job of keeping things, allowing things to be sparse, by doing a forward page table, the size of the page table is of order of the size of the virtual address space not the amount of DRAM you have. Whereas here, this is of size, the amount of DRAM you've got, okay? And so that's why uh, inverted page tables have shown up in a few architectures over the years, actually supported in hardware, okay? So um, things like the PowerPC, the UltraSpark, the IA64, that's the one I just showed you, all had inverted page tables supported in hardware. And um, you know, there's more complexity to it. Um, and uh, so the hardware is a little more complicated and the page tables themselves don't have any locality because it's a hash table. And so while the previous things we were showing you, the pages can be, page table entries can be cached in the cache, here it's much harder with the inverted page table. Okay, and what makes it inverted is really that we're taking the virtual address and kind of um, looking up the physical page rather than um, taking the virtual, or uh, the way to think about this is this hash table is is got one entry per physical page, whereas the previous thing has an entry per virtual address. Okay, and that's why it's inverted. It's it's what's stored in here is an entry per physical page, whereas what was stored in the other one was kind of an entry per virtual page. Um, and uh, whether it's faster or slower depends a lot on the architecture. It certainly potentially a lot faster than looking up nine entries. It's certainly not simpler though. So it's a question of simplicity of the hardware.
So the total size of the page table here is roughly equal to the number of pages used by the program in physical memory rather than the number of pages in the virtual memory. So we can compare some of our options. We talked about really simple segmentation. That was actually an example of what was in the very first x86s before there was even paging. That was before the x, uh, the 8386. Um, you get very fast context switching because you're just changing the segment map um, and there's no page tables to go through, so it's very fast, but we got external fragmentation. So we very quickly got rid of that and we put in some level of paging and the different schemes we've been talking about all have some advantages or disadvantages. The simple paging was just, uh, they had no external fragmentation, but the page size was huge and you couldn't have any sparseness in the, in the virtual uh, memory. And then we talked about several different uh, options here for um, paging, okay? And all of the remaining ones other than the simple segmentation basically all have the page as a basic unit of allocation and thereby we don't have that external fragmentation problem we did with segments. So how do we do translation? Well, um, the MMU basically has to translate virtual address to physical address on every instruction fetch, every load, every store. Um, those of you that remember 61C and caching will remember there was a lot of work done to try to make a load and a store fast by having first and second level caches. What I've just done here in the way I've described this lookup so far is I've made that really slow again because yeah, maybe my cache is fast, but before I can figure out where to look in the cache, I got to go to DRAM and uh, look up a bunch of stuff in a page table and then I have an address which I can then look up quickly in the, in the cache, okay? Um, the one, ex uh, the one um, example where that's not true would be with a virtual cache, but we're going to talk about physical caches because those are um, pretty much what everybody has these days, okay? So what does the MM do on a, MMU do on a translation? Well, in a first level page table, it's got to read the page table entry, check some valid bits, and then uh, go to memory. Second level has to read a couple of page table entries out of DRAM, check valid bits, and so on. N level page table, much more expensive. And so um, clearly we can't go to the, um, the page table all the time or we got problems. We've just destroyed all of the cool cache locality we've been working with. So um, what do we do about this, okay? So where and what is the MMU? So typically we have a processor and then we have the MMU between the processor and the cache and then we have a memory bus where the physical DRAM is. So the processor requests uh, read virtual addresses to the memory system through the MMU to the cache. And so we want to figure out how to make this thing fast. Um, when we make this request, sometimes later, we get data either back from the cache or back from the physical memory. And uh, we want to try to have the principles of locality work well on this. Okay, so what is the MMU doing? The MMU is, well, the simple thing is it's translating, right? From virtual to physical, as long as it does that translation correctly, we don't care how it makes itself fast. So there's nothing that I've done so far in describing the translation as a tree of tables that requires us to go to the full tree of tables all the time, as long as we can keep something fast consistent with the actual tree of tables, okay? So let's see if we can use caching to help, okay? So if you remember caching, Okay, and this is, uh, this is a picture of me and my desk, which you guys can't see because of my background, right, um, on my Zoom. A cache, if you remember, is a, a repository for copies that can be accessed more quickly than the original, and we're going to try to make the frequent case fast and the infrequent case less dominant. So caching basically underlies everything in uh, computers, and the operating system, I like to joke, is all about caching everything, okay? So um, everything's about a little bit about protection and dual mode, but the rest of it's about caching. So you can ca cache memory locations, you can cache address translations, you can cache pages, file blocks, file names, network routes, you name it, you can cache it. And the rest of the term is gonna be about how we can use caching in clever ways to make things faster. Um, it's only good though, if the frequent case is frequent and the infrequent case is not too expensive. So that means, that when I put something on that desk so that I can look at it frequently, um, it better be the case that I am frequently looking at things on my desk. Otherwise, I'm basically just wasting desk space. 
It also ought to be the case that when I can't find something on that desk, that um, it doesn't take too long to find it. Otherwise, uh, everything is just slow, no matter how good your caching is. OK, and so an important measure, which this is just reminding you guys, is the typical average memory access time, AMAT, um, which is the hit rate times the hit time plus the miss rate times the miss time. OK, and that's uh, that should be familiar to you. So hit rate plus uh, miss rate together add to 1. So for instance, uh, this is 61C idea, right? So the processor has to go to DRAM. It's 100 nanoseconds all the time. Uh, or if I put a cache that's one nanosecond, um, I, maybe I can make this a much faster um, operation on average if I can put some uh, the right stuff in the cache. So the average memory access time, which I just showed you, um, is, uh, for instance, like this. If the hit rate of the cache is 90%, then the average memory access time is 0.9 times 1, which is the time to get that out of the one nanosecond cache, plus 0.1, that's that 10% where I miss it, times 101. Now, why 101? Well, because in a situation like this, I go all the way down to DRAM, I pull it into the cache, and then I do that last access out of the cache. And so the, um, the final here is, uh, on average, 11.1 .1 nanoseconds as opposed to 100 nanoseconds. So I've gained a lot by having a 90% hit rate. Okay. If the hit rate's 99%, Notice that my average comes down to 2 nanoseconds, 2.01. So the higher my hit rate, the better I can do. Okay. And the other thing is you can do the following. You can say that miss time includes the hit time plus the miss penalty. So when I miss, it's both the time to hit, which is the 1 nanoseconds, plus the time to actually do the miss. So that's why I ended up with 101 nanoseconds there. Now, uh, another region, the reason to deal with caching is basically this, right? Look at all of these uh, lookups in various memories, looking up things, uh, checking uh, permissions, et cetera. We just got to do this somehow quickly, OK? And if, we're, if the I irony of this is if we're using caching to make loads and stores fast, but to figure out what to load and store, we have to go to DRAM, then that's ironic, OK? <laughs> In a very big way. So we want to have caching be fast enough that we get back our advantage for, uh, excuse me, we want to make the, the translation fast enough that we get back our advantage for caching. And that's kind of where we need to go. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use a translation look aside buffer or TLB to cache our translations and thereby make this fast. Okay, and why does caching work? Well, you know about locality. This is 61C. There's temporal locality which is locality and time, that says basically if I access something now, I'm likely to access it soon again, right? Spatial locality says that if I access something, I'm likely to access something close to it in physical memory, okay? That's spatial locality. And spatial locality, uh, temporal locality is clearly because we have loops and all sorts of stuff where we tend to access things over and over again. Spatial locality is because we build objects that are in structures. And so when you access one thing in a structure, you tend to access the other one uh, soon. Okay, And so um, we can look about at caches as an address stream coming from the processor that works its way through an upper level cache and then a second level cache and so on down to memory. And we can start talking about what's the total performance we get by adding caching. Okay. Now, if you remember the memory hierarchy, um, this is a good example where we have registers that are extremely fast. Then we have level one cache, which is uh, quite fast. Um, level two caches, which is bigger but slower. Level three cache, which is maybe shared on a multi-core system, um, additionally slower. And then um, main memory is even slower. SSD is slower. Uh, disk is slower. But you notice that as we get slower, we also get a lot bigger. So that speed. Uh, relationship between speed and size is really physics, okay? Because something that can store a huge amount of data is going to take longer to get at than something that can only store a limited amount of data, all right? And really, we want our address translation here between the speed of registers in the L1 cache, okay? But main memory, which is where our page table is stored, is down here. So there's clearly a problem, right? We're talking about things in sub-nanoseconds versus things 
in um, multiple nanoseconds to get to, or hundreds of nanoseconds to get to DRAM. And so we can't have every access go to memory or we, we got a problem, okay? So now the time to access memory and the time to access DRAM, um, if I made that distinction, uh, partially it's because um, kind of everything down here is sometimes maybe considered storage. Um, I'm not, uh, I don't want to confuse you much though. So if I say memory and I don't um, make any distinctions, I'll be talking about DRAM. So I didn't mean to make that distinction for you. Um, sorry about that confusion. So we want to just cache the results of the recent translations. And so what that means is let's make a table that sort of goes from virtual uh, page frame to physical frame. And we'll just keep a few of them around so that we can be very fast. And so really, um, this table, which is a quick lookup table, needs to be consistent with the page tables, but it needs to be small enough that it's really fast so that we can work between the processor and the cache, OK? And that's the TLB. It's really recording recent virtual page number to uh, physical page number, uh, or physical page frames, those are the same thing, translations. Um, if a lookup is present, then you have the physical address uh, without reading any of the page tables and you're quick, okay? Um, this was actually invented by uh, Sir Maurice Wilkes, who is uh, one of the uh, famous luminaries for designing computer architecture. He actually developed this thing before caches were developed. Um, and uh, when you come up with a new concept, you get to name it. So if you're wondering why it's called a translation look aside buffer, uh, you know, it's because he decided to call it that and get to name it anything you want. And people eventually uh, realize that if it's good for page tables, why not for the rest of data and memory? And that's where caches came from. The question in the chat here about is the TLB stored on the processor um, is an interesting one. Uh, today, absolutely. This is part of the core. There's the processor, the MMU, and the first level cache. Those are all uh, tightly bound on the same little chunk of the chip even. Um, and I'll show you a picture. We may not get to it today where I show you that. Uh, originally, it, the MMU was actually a separate chip back in the 80s and early 90s. And so it's been getting closer and closer to the processor at the same time the caches is, have been getting closer and closer to the processor. Okay. So when a TLB miss happens, the page tables may be cached, so you only go to, to memory. So here's a, another look at this. So the CPU gets a virtual address that hands it to the TLB. The TLB says, is it cached? If the answer is yes, we go immediately, have a physical address, and we go to physical memory. Now here, um, for Sarah, who asked this question earlier, here, this physical memory could be uh, the cache-backed DRAM, OK? So I'm actually explicitly not saying DRAM here. But whatever we want to do here that's fast is this is uh, our cache and DRAM, OK? Um, and so. If the TLB is cached and if the TLB is fast enough, then we can get a virtual address, go through the TLB quickly, and look up in our cache. And now we're, we've scored, right? Because that's fast. If, on the other hand, it's not in the TLB, then we have to go to the MMU and actually walk the page table, take the resulting TLB entry stored in the TLB, and then we can go to cache. And the hope is that, and then uh, obviously, if we're in the kernel and we're doing untranslated stuff, we can go around the TLB. Um, the question is really, is this caching going to work? Is there locality in our page translations? And uh, the answer, if you think about it, certainly instructions have a huge amount of locality, right? Because you do loops, the code is executed together, so you got spatial locality. So certainly for, um, for instructions, this sounds clear. Stack has a lot of locality, spatial locality, so this sounds good. And even data accesses, they don't have as much locality, but they do have enough locality to make this TLB work pretty well. Okay, and so, you know, just because of what I mentioned earlier, objects tend to be together in physical space, and so that's going to lead to locality in the TLB. And I'm going to remind you guys, I don't think we're going to get to it this time, but I'll remind you next time about all the stuff you learned about caches. Caches can be uh, multiple levels. There can be first level cache, second level cache. And so you can do the same thing with TLBs. There's nothing that says that the TLB, which is a cache, can't have first, second, third levels. Okay. And, and modern processors have multiple levels of TLB caching. All right. So what kind of a cache is the TLB? 
Well, we can start talking about things like, well, it's got some number of sets, um, and the line size is the storage, uh, you know, how much is in the page table entries. And so we can talk about what's the associativity of these ca this cache, um, et cetera. All right, and so this is uh, where I'm gonna remind you a little bit of some of the caching things that you remember. So you might ask, the first question might be, how might the organization of a TLB differ from that of a conventional instruction or data cache? Okay, and um, to do that, we're gonna start by remembering what causes cache misses, okay? And then um, next time we'll talk more about cache structures, but th there's uh, the so-called three C's, which are actually from Berkeley, uh, Mark Hill, who's been a professor at uh, University of Wisconsin for a long time, uh, when he was a graduate student at Berkeley, came up with the three C's, and um, that was the compulsory misses, capacity misses, and conflict misses. The compulsory misses are the first time you access something and it's never been accessed before, there's no way the cache could have it because it's never seen it before. That's a compulsory miss or a cold miss, okay? Um, pretty much a compulsory miss, you can't do anything about. The best you can do is uh, pull it in from memory or if you can prefetch, that would be one way you might be able to deal with compulsory misses. Capacity misses are examples where you pull something into the cache, but the cache is just too small and therefore, um, you know, the next time you go looking for it, it's not there. Co conflict misses are cases where um, you actually have some associativity that's smaller than fully associative. And that's an example where two entries overlap each other in the cache. You pull the first one in, you access the second one, kicks the first one out. And then when you go looking for the first one again, you now have a conflict miss. So in the case of compulsory misses, the best you can do there is to figure out how to have some sort of prefetching. In the case of capacity misses, you gotta make your cache bigger. In the case of conflict misses, this is the case where either making the cache bigger or increasing associativity is gonna be of importance. And we'll, we'll explore that next time, okay? Um, the, I like to call this fourth C, I like to say that there's three Cs plus one. The fourth C is a coherence miss which we will talk about uh, a bit as well, um, but that's an invalidation miss where you have multiple processors. Process A, uh, processor, excuse me, A, core A reads some data, core B writes the data that invalidates the data that core A had. When core A goes to look at it again, it's a miss and it's a coherence miss. Okay. So um, I'm gonna leave it at that since we're running out of time, but um, uh, in conclusion, We've been talking a lot about page table structures, which is really uh, what does the MMU do and how does it structure the, uh, the mapping between virtual and physical addresses in memory. And we talked about this notion that memory is divided into fixed size chunks as being very helpful um, and uh, that those fixed size chunks are pages. And the virtual page number goes from virtual addresses mapped through the, physical, the page table to physical page number, okay? Um, we talked about multi-level page tables, which is virtual addresses mapped to a series of tables, and this is a way of dealing with sparseness. Uh, and then we talked about the inverted page table as uh, basically providing a hash table uh, that was more closely related to the size of the, the um, physical memory rather than the size of the virtual address space. Okay, now we've been talking about the principle of locality, reminding you about temporal locality and spatial locality. We talked briefly about the three uh, major categories of cache misses, compulsory, conflict, capacity, and then coherence for that plus one. As you can imagine, in the case of the TLB, if we miss in the TLB, that can be very expensive because we have to do many DRAM accesses potentially in a miss in the TLB. So we have to be very careful to have as few misses as possible. And that's gonna lead us to higher associativity or even a fully associative cache, okay? And so when we talk next time about cache organizations like direct map, set associative, fully associative, we're gonna talk about high, highly associative ones, okay? And um, we've also talked about the TLB this time, which is uh, a small number of page table entries are actually cached on the processor, so they're extraordinarily fast. It's the speed of registers. And on a, um, on a hit, you basically have the full advantage of caching. Um, of the regular loads and stores being able to translate quickly and then go to the actual data cache or instruction cache. On a miss, you gotta go and traverse the page table. All right, 
So I think we're good there. Um, I'm going to let you guys go. I hope you have a great weekend. And um, next Monday, we will pick up uh, with our uh, brief uh, memory lane through some caches. And, and then we're going to start talking about page faults and um, interesting things that we can do with them. So I hope you have a great day, a great evening, and a great weekend. We'll see you next week.